Hello and welcome to today's episode of International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the top stories from around the world. Let's take a look at the headlines. COP26 to address climate-linked damage amid mass protest. Socialist President Daniel Ortega leads Nicaragua's election. Anti-coup civil disobedience continues in Sudan. And Palestine Authority rejects Israel's veto of the United States consulate plan. In our first story, the second week of COP26 opened with the Adaptation Laws and Damage Day on November the 8th. The conference will resume following mass protests worldwide over the weekend. Over 100,000 people, including indigenous communities, trade unions and activists, took to the streets in Glasgow. They demanded systemic change to achieve climate justice. The COP26 conference has been condemned for excluding marginalized and frontline voices. Travel restrictions and other last-minute rule changes have meant that only four Pacific Island states have made it to Glasgow. Around two-thirds of civil society groups which usually attend COP are not present. Meanwhile, among the largest delegations at COP26 seems to have been sent by the fossil fuel industry. According to Global Witness, 503 people are set to lobby on behalf of oil and gas companies. Talks around financing for climate-linked loss and damages are scheduled for Monday. Rich countries have successfully avoided any legal liabilities for their emissions so far. Moreover, they have also consistently fallen short of the $100 billion a year in climate finance pledged in 2009. As per reports, this goal will not be reached before 2023. Moreover, around 70% of these finances will be provided as loans. This will mean more debt for poor countries who are reportedly already spending five times more on debt payments than their climate response. To address the urgency of the crisis, a parallel People's Summit for Climate Justice has been convened in Glasgow. Organized by the COP26 coalition, it is bringing together indigenous and frontline communities, activists and social movements. In our next story, Incumbent President Daniel Ortega has taken the lead in Nicaragua's general election held on November the 7th. With 49.25% of the votes counted as of early Monday morning, he has secured 74.99%. Ortega is the leader of the Socialist Sandinista National Liberation Front or FSLN party. In second place is Walter Espinoza of the Constitutionalist Liberal Party with 14.4% of the votes. According to the Supreme Electoral Council, 65.3% of the 4.5 million eligible voters took part in the election. As per local reports, voting proceeded peacefully across over 13,000 polling stations without any major incidents. 600 journalists and 27 countries were invited to observe the elections. Celebrations broke out in several areas with the announcement of the initial results. The executive secretary of the ALBA organization also highlighted the government's achievement. Poverty has been reduced from 48% to 24%. Maternal and infant mortality have also reduced by 70% and 60% respectively. The FSLN government has also expanded access to education and healthcare. Sunday's election took place despite imperialist attempts by the United States and European Union to discredit the process. Before the results were announced, United States President Joe Biden released a statement calling it a pantomime election. He also threatened sanctions against Nicaragua. In our next story, protests and worker strikes against the military coup continued in Sudan on November the 7th. The Sudanese Professional Association and neighborhood resistance committees have organized a civil disobedience campaign. Hundreds of people gathered in the capital of Khartoum on Sunday. Similar protests were held in Omdurman, Adbara and Wadmadani. Anti-coup resistance is taking place amid continuous internet blackouts and violence by security forces. According to the Sudanese doctors committee, at least 14 people have been killed and 300 have been injured. Ahead of Sunday's protest, people barricaded roads in several cities, including Khartoum. The Sudanese Teachers Committee also held a sit-in outside the Ministry of Education. 
protesters rejected the coup and appointment of members of the former dictatorial regime to posts in the ministry. However, police forces soon attacked the teachers with tear gas. At least 87 people were detained and one person suffered a broken leg. The Khartoum State Resistance Committees have announced another march of millions on November the 13th. The protest will be held under the slogan, no negotiation, no partnership with the military and no coup legitimacy. People are demanding a full civilian government and have rejected any power-sharing deals with the military. The Palestinian Authority has condemned Israel's rejection of the reopening of a U.S. consulate in occupied East Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett stated on Saturday that there was no room for another consulate in Jerusalem. Foreign Minister Yair Lapid added that the mission could be established in the occupied West Bank instead. The Palestinian Foreign Ministry later stated that Israel, as the occupying power, had no right to veto a U.S. decision. An official also added that Israel's decision was the latest in a series of unilateral measures such as the settlements, killing and destruction, and land grabs. U.S. consulate in Jerusalem had served as its de facto embassy in Palestine. However, it was shut down by the Trump administration in 2019. Trump also recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and severed diplomatic and aid ties with Palestinians. Israel occupied East Jerusalem in 1967 and then annexed it in violation of international law. Israel's sovereignty over the area is not recognized internationally. East Jerusalem has been claimed by the Palestinian people as the capital of their future state. U.S. President Joe Biden had promised during his election campaign that his government would reopen the consulate. That's all for today. For more details and stories, visit our website at www.peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.